My name is Cole Thornton. I'm a, I'm a senior at Davidson College and a senior intern for the uh, Van Eversmith Galleries. Um, yeah, I'm an art history major from Nashville, Tennessee. Excellent. I'm Tim Noe. I am a professor of visual arts at UMBC, and I'm a current American Council on Education fellow. Oh, very cool, very cool. All right, well, we have your your piece, um, Cube Becoming, on Albers, and can you talk a little bit about your interest in Albers for uh, for our people who are going to be to be doing your piece? Uh, we actually do have an Albers. We have one of his excellent um, home uh, to a square. So. That it's a, it's a pretty exciting connection that we have. Right. Well, I think um, when we tend to think about uh, major figures in abstraction, we think about Albers. But for me, there's a very personal connection in that I studied with a painter named Mel Leipzig, who was a study of uh, a student of Albers at Yale. And so I saw this direct translation between Albers and Albert's approach to color and his color sensibility and studies move through him from basically from the Bauhaus to the uh, United States and to Mel. And even though Mel was a really um, phenomenal realist painter, especially of portraiture and spaces, Albert's color sensibility definitely influenced Mel's complete approach to color. And I can still see echoes of that in Mel's current work, even though he's now in his 80s. And through Mel, I experience Albers. And of course, now I teach Albers as well when I talk about color relationships and color theory and so forth. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask that the composition has really intense colors. Um, I, when I watched it, I, I experienced a lot of, a lot of pink, a lot of uh, kind of consistently throughout. So did you, yeah, why, why, I would wonder what your thought process was with, with color selection um, for this specific piece, Cube, Becoming After Al Albers. Right, and it's pointedly called Becoming because with mm -hmm. uh, video synthesis, whether it's done, um, it's a kind of lensless animation. And it's really a process of witnessing and creation in that you are patching together different oscillations in color and you're approaching them through just simple formulations of red, green, and blue. And, you know, I have a synthesizer sitting here. I've got, this is very old school, right? Oh, wow. Really taking oscillations of sine waves or ramps and you are using patch cables to connect those systems together and eventually be output as video. And so you are, as a, a studio practitioner, waiting for things to show up and you're going to punch record. And so it's really a process of witnessing and discovery constantly. You're waiting for those things to arrive at a pleasing kind of impression for you that you hope that will then impress itself on the audience. And, you know, for me, it's a constant process of an aha moment. You know, you're you're in the same way that you're mix, mixing a palette sometimes and you're discovering on your palette relationships between form. If you're working like currently I'm painting on paper or painting on canvas too. And you start to pull forward those relationships and you start to see how they work with advancement and recession and all the other things that happen and just edge relationships and so forth. The same things happen in the video space too. So you can see how the forms evolve over time and they can surprise you and they can also entrance you too. So that's one of the qualities that I was really interested in was the sort of meditative or ecstatic kind of relationships that can happen in color sometimes. And I think that's true of Albers too, that whole push pull falling into the picture uh, relationship is something that I was really interested in maintaining from my experience of Albers or Rothko or Oscar Fischinger or somebody like that, that I wanted to kind of magnetize the eye. And I knew for your installation in particular, you've got this massive video wall and you've got this thing that's coaxing your eye toward it <laughs> in the same way that it's hard to have a conversation sometimes when the TV is on and everybody's eye is drawn to that picture tube. I wanted that kind of 
that lure of color and form to call people and maybe quiet them for a while or draw their attention for a while. Um, because that's my experience in the studio. I'll get a patch operating. I'll leave it alone for a while and I'll come back to it. And then I'll have that entrancing moment in which I say, I've really got to record this one because I might have operations of those things for hours in the studio before I finally get pulled in and say, I really need this one. And you literally just press that record button and let that moment go to a file, basically. Back in the day, it would have been tape. That's fascinating, and, and you, you certainly did that successfully. I, I was I was laughing to myself. My, my next question, I wrote, I felt pushed and pulled uh, by the work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you talked a little bit about this, but I was wondering if you could go a little deeper on on the role that um, kind of the performance, and then the audio, or the viewership plays in the work, and and you talked a little bit about you you know you wanted the viewer's experience to be pulled in and to be calmed. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about yeah, like how, how you develop that experience that you know that desire to, for viewers to have that experience, and if you have any more thoughts around the viewer's experience and the audience and the role that that plays in, in your making of right. art. Right. So I've done really big public events, like uh, there's an event here in Baltimore City called Light City, in which you do a festival. It usually would fall on what they would call a margins uh, season, somewhere between football and baseball or whatever, but a big public event that would bring people to our inner harbor. And I did one of those with a very spectacular um, light piece. and. In that, I saw the draw of the audience to it and their interaction with it. So in that particular piece, people waved their hands over a couple sensors to mix these different frequencies of light that would produce different kinds of dancing patterns and sounds. And so that's one kind of very spectacular big kind of work, but I've also done smaller, much quieter contemplative pieces that are meant for installation and in that kind of situation i might set up a series of four uh old school crt monitors and they're meant to be looked at and gazed upon but they're also meant to wash the entire environment with colored light and they they operate much more in the realm of a james terrell piece they're meant to be environments and they're meant to pull you in and allow you to spend quiet time with them and so in, in that regard, I can think about the works as working at different registers, that they can be very spectacular and they can be kind of highly entertaining and focused for a moment, or they can be pieces that you want to linger with for a while if you choose to. And so it's somewhat like the difference between a Saturday morning cartoon and light filtering in through stained glass. You know, like there, there are these uh, sublime moments and then there are kind of pop, fun um, eye catchers too. And the work and the tools can work along all of those kinds of um, wavelengths, if you will. That's fascinating. That Yeah, that also leads perfectly uh, into my last question, which yeah, you've talked about the different environments and experiences you can create with digital art and then and then the overlap that you know working with colors have with your experience as a painter um so my last question is what are the broadly the social artistic and, and innovative potentialities of digital art both in general and then the specific art that you produce digitally right i mean um the interesting thing for me is that um much of what is new has been done you know in the 20th century or mm -hmm before that. So there were artists who were experimenting with color sensations and installations well before the digital era. Uh, whether they were working on film or they were working on devices that would produce these very sensational experiences, sometimes in your own home. And so for me, um, I'm aware of that history and I'm aware that Something like this, which is purely analog, also has its expression through digital tools and software too. Mm -hmm. And that's because the lore of the experience remains the same. We want that sensation of elevation. We want that sensation of being transported. We want to be out of our heads, literally, for 
a while. So whether we're watching WandaVision and experiencing that lore of digital realities, um, which are very spectacular and magical and transformative, or we're experiencing a great work of abstract art like a Rothko, and we approach it and we immerse ourselves in that direct experience before the canvas. So I think artists are very aware that they are experience makers and that uh, the audience, when they share in the experience of creation with us and wonder, that's sort of the peak connection with an audience. And one thing that we hope to experience ourselves as, you know, we're along this path of discovery as an artist in our studio, but we want a very similar experience for our audience. We want them to gaze into the work, to get lost in the work, to pull somebody else over to it because we're so super distracted now. So if we can linger for a moment and we can be transported for a moment, we're doing what we need to do as artists.